pints. What are you having then, Jonathan? A uh, pint, please, mate. Two pints, please, landlord. So, Ian, where's our audience sitting then? Uh, they're over there, sat on that table over there. Oh, yeah, I can see them. Um, OK, well, before we go over there, what are we going to tell them? Well, we're just going to tell them it's a relaxing environment where we can discuss, you know, all stuff around business transformation. OK, cool. So who, who's actually over there? Who have we got? There's some executives, some professionals, uh, some a few consultants. Cool, fantastic. Well, let's crack on. Let's get over there. Welcome to the Beer and Butterfly. A podcast where we talk transformation. Kingston. And I'm Jonathan Parnaby. And we're your hosts. So in today's episode, we're going to understand behavioural change. So we're back. We're back again. We're, we're doing well this this uh, um, this season. We we seem to we seem to be having guests all the time, and we've got another guest today. Yeah, we're not on our own. It's I think we've had more episodes with guests than we have without, which is amazing. So yes, uh, welcome. Yeah. Our guest, go on in. Ian, introduce him. He's sat in the corner. <laughs> right, Simon, Simon, introduce yourself. Hello, guys. I, I was just passing the pub and I was just wondering who, who was going to be in. But uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, my name's Simon Woodhouse. I'm a, I'm a business change manager and a communications guy as well. Uh, I've been doing that for what best part of 15 years now. Um, last few years, I've developed a real interest in, in human nature as a result of the sort of self-development journey I've been on to better understand myself. And that's led me to, I think, have a better insight into um, business change management and the human element of it and how we relate to others from knowing ourselves better. That's led on to more and more interest areas in uh, organisational change and behavioural change, which is the subject of today. So what I'm hoping to do is uh, have a chat with you guys, have a laugh, see where we go and see if I can bring in some some of the learnings that I've uh, I've experienced to, to try and uh, try and aid people's understanding. Yeah, brilliant. Well, it's great, great to have you here, Simon, and thank you for walking past the the beer and butterfly at the exact right time to, uh, on the right evening, and <laughs> and come yeah. and join us for a pint because it's uh, saw the flyer outside. I'll tell you, good, good. So, yeah, the, uh, the working, advertising then. budget is working. Yeah. Nice eight board, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's brilliant to to revisit for me. Um, it's brilliant to revisit the the, the change management conversation because our listeners know that I've been harping on about change management probably in every episode just like ian harps on about value um <laughs> which of course i know is important but it's good <laughs> to kind of revisit but i think what what i'm really excited about this conversation coming up is is your i wouldn't say it's a unique spin but it's your um as you said your take on on the, the human psychology side of it and i think that's just an in, really interesting topic so yeah i can't wait to to, to get started but, but i think before we do We've got a few things to, to cover right in. Got a few yep. things to, to get through. Yeah, yep. I want to know the answer from um, <laughs> last week's quiz. Did you know what the question was? No. <laughs> uh, so, Simon, just to uh, um, let you know, obviously we do a, a pub quiz uh, every week, and and I'm sure you've been following along. And if not, um, why not? Because it's the pub quiz of the, the century. <laughs> We're putting it there first. Um, but the the question that we asked uh, in last week's episode with our other guest, uh, Rob Llewellyn, um, was how many chuckers are there in a polo match? And no one got this answer. Because <laughs> I think the first question was, what's a chucker? Chucker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that would have been my initial response. Yeah, I think it would have been mine if I hadn't looked the question and, and answer up. But essentially a chucker is um it's like a a period of time in in a match so it's a bit like a quarter or a half but i think they last about seven minutes long and to be honest i'm doing your polo research haven't you (laughs) what you mean i've gone on wikipedia and have a look (laughs) oh no i thought you'd been out there you know no no no, i've got a clue i think as i say if you asked me the question i wouldn't i wouldn't have known but i think it it depends as well on what type of polo match it is but the answer i've got is six there are six chuckers 
And any polo enthusiasts out there, I'm sure, will go, no, there isn't. There's eight or there's four, uh, <laughs> depending on <laughs> certain rules. And it's, I don't know whether it's a bit like, you know, rugby league and rugby union, and it's all a bit, you know, similar but different. Um, but, yeah, six. Six chuckers in a polo match. There you go. That's one for the memory so we've learned something finally yeah. <laughs> finally on the podcast we've taught something we, we we've learned what a chucker is yeah well, well, I've, i feel enriched thank you <laughs> you're welcome <laughs> so yeah but anyway but what we've been up to gents what's 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 new i'm gonna go to you ian oh, i knew you were gonna come to me straight away yeah. um what have I been up to myself you say that's why <laughs> i still i can tell you what i haven't been up to for starters I still cool. haven't put my gates up, but that's going to happen this weekend. You've so got to next, the retro, we told you. You're ne- ne- close now. Uh, hey, in ne- next episode, you're going to hear about the gates. Um, I I haven't been surfing. I <laughs> haven't been out on my bike much because I've been working too much. Um, what else haven't I been doing? Oh, I've got, I think I mentioned this previously, but I've got tickets for Wimbledon. So... Gonna, yeah, gonna gonna go there. So again, that'll be a story for another time. So really, not much to <laughs> add, really. Um, yeah, I can't think of what I've been doing other than working, Johnson. Yeah, it's been a bit like that with me. It's all work and uh, well, I've I've had a good. I, I just forgot what I did this weekend, which is really bad because it was my tenth wedding anniversary week. <laughs> So usually you forget before, don't you? Not not straight afterwards, but yeah, uh, yeah. So we um, went away to Dartmouth um, for the weekend. Oh, cool! And uh, yeah, stayed away without the kids. Uh, kind of did the whole, you know, spa thing and went in the pool, chilled out, ate lots of food. You know, general general kind of wedding anniversary thing so it's been a very very relaxing weekend to be fair and uh this weekend we're i don't know if you remember a few weeks ago we were supposed to go camping and uh, and yeah. we had those uh wind weather warnings uh ah, yeah 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 where, <laughs> where awnings were blowing away and things yeah, like that yeah yeah so we are rebooked uh we rebooked the uh the camping trip to to this weekend coming up so and again looking at the weather it looks awful so you know standard <laughs> uh, but it's only rain. I think we can cope with that. And uh, the kids, I don't think I could just tell the kids we're not doing it again. I think they were really disappointed <laughs> last time. But, but yeah, I've not really watched much films. I'm still watching Loki. Um, I need to oh, watch. Tonight. I've started, I've caught up on Loki, but not yeah. today's. Yeah. So I have done something. There Yay. you go. There so, you go. Because yeah, I caught up. I caught up. Yeah, we're in the same place, which is cool. Yeah. I'm really, really, really enjoying it. Yeah, What's Loki. Loki. It's the Marvel. Do you ever watch any of the Marvel films, Simon? Uh no, no. Oh, there you go then. Yeah, you, you, no, you, it's the same you, level that Luigi is polo, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me and him, we're like kids, so we 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 kind of just really enjoy that kind of popcorn action flick that you don't really have to think too much, and and yeah, the kids kids all enjoy it, and I'd. I'd I tell a lie. I, I think I enjoy it more than the kids do. <laughs> I, I certainly do. I think yeah. it's me who who brings right. it on in our house and kind of says, "Oh, let's watch this and let's watch that." And I'm just, yeah. I'll tell you what I have. Watched. I have watched. Um, it's not particularly new. It's a couple of years old. But um, what we do in the shadows. I've heard about this. Yeah, um, you heard about this, Simon? About the vampires? I haven't heard no. No, it's it's. It's kind of set, it's like a mockumentary. So if you think like The Office kind of style and the way it's filmed, um, but it's set around these these three vampires <laughs> who <laughs> are, all, are all sharing this residence in That's Staten true. Island. And they, they kind of emigrated over to Staten Island from, from Europe after obviously terrorizing uh, Europe over the, uh, you know, kind of the, the olden days. And they've gone over to Staten Island and they're they, supposed to have kind of led dominion over the, the new world. And they've just got really lazy and they're just, they're just rubbish. But it's really funny. Um, and you've got Matt Berry. Um, he plays oh, with them. Uh, he, and he's just, he's, you know, he just plays himself. I'm sure he does. But he's, he's fantastic in there. And uh, yeah, it's just really stupid. But I've been really enjoying it. But it's based off a film off, off the same name, which is uh, um, done by... Oh God, who was it? Ta- Taika Waititi, who do actually directed uh, Thor Ragnarok, and um, 
Oh. That might be my kind of film. I love yeah, Thor Ragnarok. I, I think it is that kind of humour. It's, it's quite zany and, and strange, but yeah, I'd recommend it if, if you've not okay. watched it. Okay. That's, that's another one from a list. Yeah, ridiculous, <laughs> but it's funny. Ridiculous. Many rainy days we have over here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, Simon, enough about us. What what have you been doing? Well, um, it's extremely boring in comparison. There was a big sporting event last night, wasn't there? I watched a bit of that. What, what was that? Uh, <laughs> it was a, there was a polo match on just down the left. <laughs> How many chuckers were there? <laughs> Eight. It was a different different, oh, a different <laughs> one. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. England, England sort of um, pulled out a top draw result, didn't they? They did. Was, I was, uh, I was. Um, uh, well, I was probably like everybody else, to be honest with you. <laughs> kind of sat there waiting to to, to wonder whether we're That's actually going to manage it or not and <laughs> not yes. getting too excited but then you know you know what it's like so um yeah, yeah. no it's good yeah, so who, who we got next ukraine ukraine isn't it yeah yeah okay yeah, when's that play- saturday <laughs> yeah yeah we're playing in rome for some reason oh okay uh due to in rome yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Beat, beat Ukraine. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, yeah. Then, then um, semi final beckons. I mean, don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but. No, I'm not going to jinx anything. I'm just going to stay real, you know, not 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 say anything too yeah. much. Just really enjoyed last night. <laughs> yeah. Really, really, really impressed with the team and the manager, how we set them up, sent them out there. And they they played to win the game rather than play the best football. I thought they were quite calm yeah. about it. Very much. I, I wouldn't have been that calm in that situation, but <laughs> there you go. Yeah. It's probably why I'm not a footballer in the in the you know anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that, yeah, that's what people are saying about Southgate. He creates this environment within the camp that people can be themselves, and you know it's gets people to he wants people to express themselves feel comfortable so presumably that's how the team goes out and plays must be a change story in there somewhere so yeah, I, I was going to get on to that I thought it was a bit too cheesy I'll, I'll let you come in there <laughs> <laughs> you can reference back now Ian's made the segue so uh, <laughs> yeah I got it. Yeah. yeah absolutely but no I, yeah I, I was I was really impressed with it um We'll, we'll see what happens in the next one because it's going to get more harder, isn't it? In the sense of the nerves and the further you get into it, the the more you've got to lose, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't particularly follow football anyway, but I think with tournaments um, like the Euros and the World Cup, I I keep a watchful eye. And, and, and as as the uh, the excitement mounts, as we get, ideally, get closer and closer, then I think, oh, I think I'll watch this match. But I normally yeah. will yeah. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it's, get, it's getting to that stage now, I think, where anything could happen. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to take up Ian's mantle for a behavioural change angle on this. I think, you know, England have got to develop. I think we've got this mentality in tournaments. Um, everybody expects us to sort of play out a certain way, certainly against the Germans, and be and be sort of heroic losers. Yeah. How can we turn that into gracious winners, and and, and really because it's not it, it won't be like us to really flaunt it, you know, because we'll never believe it, will we? You know, we kind of like. So how how can we be gracious, humble winners and and, and win like um, um you know win like you're supposed to, you know, yeah, yeah. without arrogance and what have you. That's that's befitting our nation, and I think that's a that's a mindset shift and a behavioural change, and and I think that's what he's doing within the camp. There you go. Do you want cheese with that? <laughs> Some fromage. <laughs> but no, it's so true. It's so true, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's amazing how, you know, the norm in in inverted air quotes, uh, yeah, can kind of just kind of steer your behaviours because that's the way we've always thought. Um, that's the way we're always going to think in the future. So, yeah, in using that analogy and that example is just it's quite good, isn't it? Because it's tr- so true. <laughs> I, think so. I think so. Yeah, yeah, and and it's and it's an example of what Southgate's doing from the inside. He's um, some some of the, pun- the the commentators and 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 pundits were talking about him living in a bubble and not being influenced by the press and all of these other factors. He's like, no, he's going to do it his way, create his culture, 
and the outcome will speak for itself, good or bad, you know. Yeah. So, you, you know, there's, there's a change metaphor right there. Yeah. He's not sticking to the same old template. Yeah. Yeah. Do yeah. Thing. Cool. Hmm? Is it oh. change or is it transformation? Hey. I, I, I don't know. He's adding value, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> you should come on more often, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry, you know, I'll, I'll let it all you go. Might, <laughs> you, might, you might replace him. Uh, <laughs> I've got to go that my system now. Go on. Yeah. No, no, well, I was just going to say, let's uh, let's let's move into the um, to the main topics then. Uh, so, Simon, I mean, we we got the keys to the pub, metaphorically speaking. Handing them over to to yourself, you know, go easy on the drinks and uh, the crisps. But um, but yeah, look, where do you want to start with with this this great and exciting topic? Um. Well, we thought we'd have a general discussion and see and see how that went, what direction it took us in. And I think the idea is that the discussion would illustrate some of the some of the theories that we wanted to get across, or some of the practices. Um, I mean, we could take the football analogy, and and, and you know what Southgate is doing and how he's uh, how he's instilling behavioural change in a bunch of people. Um, you could argue that they're very young players who haven't a lot of them they haven't experienced some of the uh, the cultural norms of the past mm -hmm. you know um, from a change metaphor perspective you know do you want to get a group of believers in an organization who, who, who are not sort of um, entrenched in the prevailing culture you know bunch of bunch of graduates a group a bunch of oh, that sounds that sounds a bit cliche doesn't it and a bit <laughs> i was just i was just about to say that's the trouble with that that is that isn't it the trouble with if you took the analogy of a football team that's not true of what you usually find in business because you'll have a mixture of different experiences and different not to be ageist but you'd have different ages and different groups of people um I think, um, I suppose you do have um, quite a lot of diversity in football, um, but but you know, it, it, uh, from an age point of view and experience, people set in their ways in a modern football team. I don't know whether you find that. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. But but would there be people set in a certain way of doing things? I don't know. I wouldn't know enough. <laughs> I'm not a Wait. massive football fan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think if you look at the background and the, the, the sort of, there is the diversity there, but there is certainly a prevailing culture in this country of being plucky losers, valiant losers. You know, yeah. do we have the same ruthless streak as uh, other other nations who who embody it in their, in, in, you know, in their ethos as a country? I don't, I don't know. I think. You know, you, again, it's sort of um, cultural stereotyping, but, you, you you know, you could get South Americans who are sort of, um, this is the Euros we're talking about, but in a World Cup situation, South Americans who are a bit more sort of street fighter, you know, they they, they, they win in a way that uh, means a lot to their culture. Mm -hmm. um, we're a, a touch more naive because we, 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 we toe the line of fair play, don't we? Yeah. So, you know, from a sporting analogy, I think, you would have that cultural diversity and that range of ages, but people are still brought up in the in the country with the, our, our sense of fair play, and that's how we go about doing things. Um, to add to that, to give us that sort of uh, winning edge, you know, still within those parameters of fair play is is the thing that Southgate seems to be hitting on. Well, he's found a he's found a pragmatic so, way of playing. So, so just to kind of move away, a little bit away from football on that and, and take that kind of that conversation i don't think that's the case in business i'm bringing it back to business because that's the what you know what i know i guess yeah. um but 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 um i don't know whether maybe i'm being unfair on ourselves here a bit but i don't know whether we're we deal we're kind of fair play in business Mm. Certainly, some of the transformation programs I've worked <laughs> on haven't felt that way. <laughs> but, but um, uh, you know, but you know what I mean. From a pers from a from a people change type kind of journey, if you want, I just look at it as you're, you're building a vision and a way forward, and why you need to change, and all of these things around value, kind of, and and quite often not just value benefits, money, mm. not just value in general, but but the business needs to change because it needs to compete or it needs to you know, maintain its competitiveness and do all these different changes. And and do you think we're too fair in that then? Because I, 
that tells me we're not bold enough with how we transform and do things like that. I mean, they're kind of going slightly off topic, but, but mm. you know. I think and, that, that's just different that, you know, you're comparing kind of our country's culture in the sporting environment and then passing that into a, a, a business and organisation where actually you know and I know that if you compared, you know, 15 organisations across the UK, you're going to get a, a, a hodgepodge of different cultures. I was going to say, and that's not, yeah, it's not true to to any, most organisations these days. No. Some are bold, some are risk takers, some aren't. Um, some love red tape. Uh, you know, there's, there's just a really mix <laughs> yeah. of, of things. And, and, and I think that's quite a good, good discussion point is, is, you know, is around culture in general. What is culture? What, what makes up culture? Is it, the, you know, is it the people? Is it um, history, baggage? Like there's, there's, there's so many things that are in that, that cauldron of culture in any organization, right? And over time that gets swirled around, um, you know, years and years into something which... Yeah, but it's, but again, and then coming back to um, change, if you want, and behavioral mm-hmm. change, um, don't, you, don't you think that, um, well, I can take experience from the paper industry where I've done transformation a few a couple of times and and you know you'll have people in a paper mill whose father were their grandfather were yeah. there that yeah. type of not not everybody clearly and and but 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 it's a traditional paper making is quite a tradi- traditional business yeah. and I know it's very modern these days a lot of technology and paper making these days amazing amount actually but but you know that kind of um uh, uh, it, would you say the culture for that is built up around those individuals? Because uh, I think it is. I think the culture yeah. of that organisation at that time is the people that are in it and their behaviours yeah. and how they act and what they do. And they've learned those. Yeah. And that's probably why it's quite difficult when when we're waltzing up and saying, right, we need to change and do it this way now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They always say that people mirror the bosses, don't they? Whoever your boss is, you you tend to mirror them. And that's um, an evolutionary trait as well. Um, that was a survival thing. You know, we we, we, we mirror other people because we, we're from villages. We are villages as a... As a as I a, live in a village. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, we, we, we're hardwired to get along with others and mirroring is part of that behavioral stuff um so yeah the, the culture there i think culture was once to, i heard it described as it it's what happens when managers leave the room yeah yeah i like that so <laughs> and therefore management can't influence culture it's people predominantly in organizations who decide what their behaviors are going to be based on individual decisions that are influenced by the group um you know that that's that's a that's a theory, but I think what you're saying Ian, is correct as well. Where where it comes from the top down, and in I've seen I've been in organisations which have been very dominated by personalities, and, and you can see that um, at a working level as well. Um, so culture, yeah, is one of those things that's it's sort of we all recognise it when we go into an organisation, but we can't define it yeah. as in it, it, it originated here or because of this reason or that. It's just something that, and I think the longer it goes unchallenged, or then then people repeat behaviour. Getting back to behaviour change, people repeat behaviour because it's a habit. Then that's the way we do things and the longer you do things a certain way the more you can't get out of that habit of doing them that way yeah um so if you want behavioral change which is what organizational change is it's the change of behaviors you you, you have to have this um, disruption or interruption uh, and make it easy for people to adopt a new way of working but then go through a, um, a, a period of um, negotiation with them iteratively to reach that position where they go, OK, now I'm prepared to start adopting these new ways of working. And uh, and something that, that I've seen and, and really sort of believe in is this um, behavioural change stairway model, which, I, which I've spoken to you about previously, Ian. And this, this is really around... Um, negotiation it was something the fbi developed and so if, if you if you're speaking to one person a group of people 
they, they all come with um, what, what, what we were saying before we started recording, which is three things, perception, expectations, and previous experience. Yeah. And all of that goes into the pot in a group of people. In order to get them to change their behavior, first of all, you've got to listen to them and demonstrate you're listening to them. So you show an understanding and that creates empathy, which is the second stage. So active listening, first stage, which people have heard about. Um, you're trying to get to the stage, and these are all sequential and build on each other. Get 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 to empathy stage where you're displaying an understanding of a person. And then, and then you have a rapport where they show you that essentially they understand your position and, get, and acknowledge that you understand them. That's what you're trying to get to. Yeah. There's nothing worse than feeling. Well, I suppose that's trust, then, isn't it? Is that's, that what? That's it. That 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 final stage develops that. Well, they understand me. I understand them. So there's got to be an element of trust. Then comes yes. into play. That's the outcome of that third rapport stage, which is trust is developed. From trust, that's when somebody is willing to listen to your value proposition. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Yeah, and they they want to listen to what your, um, your your solution and view of the new world is from that position. Only when they've got trust, but you have to go through those stages first to get to that, and and they all build on each other. And that from that stage, you can influence, and then you get behavioural change. The way you're influencing is that getting them to um, own the solution, which is what what we're saying about behavioural change. I'm I'm now willing to adopt the new ways of working, even though it's culturally different to what I I am used to that's when they take action then you've got behavioral change so it's a it's a sequential step thing and they, they, you know they, that is something that's taken there from um neg crisis negotiation uh, the fbi um i know that police forces use it in and, and emergency services use it in this country but it's exactly the same thing and explains um human nature and and how we interact with each other and how you how you get change and and if organizations don't recognize that and project teams or what have you you can shift through the gears very quickly and lose people yeah because yeah. we've all experienced that feeling of not being understood barriers come down then because that person hasn't displayed to you or said to you what it is you want to hear so you're not listening you're waiting for what it is you want to hear yeah so so, so I kind of use that a sim. I wouldn't say I've thought this through in in this logical way, but I kind of use a similar technique to kind of align mindsets. And it's not so much that I'm trying to align my mindset as if I've got a couple of people that I want to make sure they're aligned, yeah, or a few people that want to make sure they're aligned. So you give them an opportunity in a workshop to express their ideas. Do things they 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 you know talk about problems or whatever or challenges or opportunities, let them express their ideas, and then take them down a bit of a voting process, so they can discuss and debate and prioritise and things like that, um, which is commonly done in workshops in many different ways as you you both know I know you know because you both done thousands of workshops over the years, <laughs> but 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 um, uh, you know if you think about it that's a similar similar it's not the same i don't think but it's a similar kind of thing about how, how you're getting other people to listen to each other in yeah. that workshop environment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so hopefully they're starting to understand each other's needs and wants and, yeah. and maybe build some empathy yeah. in there some yeah. through that process maybe through the voting maybe through other things and it's not necessarily you're not going to get them all in one go but 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 but, but to start to align on some things that yeah. might that might be i've never thought of it as a trust thing but maybe that's what that is maybe that's how that's that's coming about but don't you think like i think you, it's great that we're having this conversation because it's so true it doesn't it get to a kind of a dangerous place when you've got two parties that think they're on the same page yeah. but they're not <laughs> so there's one element of you know but one party is like, well, I'm not getting what I need from the other party. So barriers go up, as you said, Simon. Um, at least that, in that situation, you know, there's work to be done, right? Um, but when both parties think they're on the same page, but actually yeah. they haven't got to that, maybe that rapport step where they validated that they were absolutely talking about the same thing. We're all in the same mindset, but really you're pulling uh, apart from each other. Then that that's quite... Um, so how, say, that's quite uh, a dangerous position to be in, isn't it? And if you don't go through those steps enough, that's what I'm trying to say. 
Mm. Yeah. So how can you beat that then? What? How? How beat that? I mean, how do you? How do you know whether they are or aren't? It's easy for you to say, Ian, you need to change, and I say, Yeah, of course, I'll change. What do you want me to do? Go running. But then <laughs> I don't. Is that the actions then that I take that prove that? I mean, how, how do you how do you know that? I, I, it's that? easy to say yes, right? And we've all been in situations where lots of people have said yes and then gone done something completely different. Yeah. So, so you know, how do you how do you know that you've achieved it? I guess is there a is there a way of doing that other than actually seeing people change their habit or whatever? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Actions speak louder than words, don't they? Um, so stand back, observe somebody, and they'll let you know their true thoughts through their actions. But also, as well, in the interaction you're having with people, the skill in active listening is to, Ian, in your example, you're saying, "Okay, I've changed. You know, I want to change. How do I know that?" Well, if we continue to 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 have conversations and the and the person who wants to find that out asks questions and continues to ask questions and that facilitates an opening of uh, your mind so you know it's a change technique or a facilitator's technique to um get the other person thinking out loud mm. Yeah, what's going on in your mind? And that won't come from one question. It will come from a series of questions that open up yeah. Yeah. into the truth, which is within you. Which is quite interesting, Jonathan, because you and I talked, and you taught me a lot about this um, some years back now, about that whole voice of the business control room stuff. We talked about it in the, in, season, in season one. and But some of that is a little bit of that, isn't it? It's about playing something out and then listening yeah and seeing where people are understanding yeah. you know and then maybe even talking about some of the challenges they have with that to understand it further and and maybe Absolutely. play it out further that's exactly what that is isn't it and it's probably you know when when we came up with with the concept it probably wasn't as uh as structured as simon's uh kind of articulating it from a psychology point of view but but the principle is the same isn't it because you know, we don't want change to be one way. We don't want this to be dictatorial. This is what we need to do by this arbitrary date that's been put into a calendar. Um, and you must succeed or else, you know, we don't. No, they've got to be willing. They've got to they've want got, to change. Yeah. So there's a whole load of work that needs to be done. And I said all the steps that you've got to get get people, um, people through. And that first piece is, you're right, is I've got my ears open. Tell me about it understand what your challenges are and acknowledging what those challenges are not just like nodding go mm -hmm, yeah yeah sure sure and then moving on to your own agenda it's it's really like you say it's give and take it's like any relationship right you, you've got to to show that one you've understood exactly what their challenge is and like you say empathize with it and then show that how are you going to to work with them to fix those those challenges yeah. And if, if we're talking about mindset, I think that's a mindset shift in the project team and the change managers and anybody who's engaging with the workforce as much as it's a mindset shift in the people you're inviting to change. 100%. I mean, just as you said that, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I just got like a mental call back to, to that particular program there and that you're referencing. And, and you're right that program team, certain members of that program team <laughs> needed a mindset shift mm -hmm. because I just remember sitting in the control room once a day. And I can't remember if we mentioned this on the episode, so apologies, listeners, if I'm kind of calling back. But I just remember being in a particular region and they were kicking off um, because the program was basically demanding all this stuff onto this particular region and say, no, we need testers. We need you to do X. We need you to work on getting the data for force procurement systems, et cetera. And it's just constant throwing stuff over the fence saying you've got to get this done by this day. And, that, and there's just no coordination. And, you know, the business region got to a point where there were like hands up, like you just, it's just too much guys. Like I, we just can't process what you're, you're asking for us. And it's coming in from, 15 different people in the program team and and they're all getting frustrated because things aren't, weren't happening well we haven't got our, our data back on time so we can't get you know our particular activities done in in the plan and and then then you'll look at change it's your fault <laughs> it's like yeah. come on 
Oh, it, so it, you know. it is, and it's that what you're describing there. I, I haven't been on a project where we haven't had scenarios like that, and I think there's a balance here. As soon as you enter pressure into a situation, people act differently. Oh, yes, they do. There's a there's a there's a bit of self preservation that goes on because of the project plan you're talking about, and people are looking are looking for deliverables, and. At the, <laughs> Projects have to run to a plan because they they've got resources and they need to deliver on dates. Correct, but I've never seen a project plan deliver change. No. And I'm and, you know contentious thing to say, but what what I mean is it, a project plan will deliver a bunch of deliverables on time to budget, etc. Quality is another issue, but it'll <laughs> deliver that on time. <laughs> we'll save that for but, another episode. <laughs> but when, when 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 the project team um, disbands and goes their way, have you got change? And there's usually a phase two in, in projects, which is the, the embedding of change or the getting of change, the adoption of the new ways of doing those are adoption techniques. And OK, that, that can be described as a post-go live event or a post-go live bunch of activities to embed the change. But, sustainable change, though, isn't it? A sustainable change. You know, have you delivered what you were going to deliver and then sustained the change or even, you know, th- then after and what work needs to go on to do that? And and it's, it's interesting as we've been talking actually because uh, uh, I'm trying to think about the change methods we use today and I still think there's quite a lot of stuff missing there that we've just talked about as being so necessary mm. Yeah, you know yeah. and, and without a plan and I'm, I'm, I'm not disputing what you said because I actually agree with what you said the plan's never delivered the change yet right but, <laughs> yeah, I, was, but I was saying you I mean you can break yeah, change down well, into <laughs> elements that allow you to plan and learn and plan and replan and learn and replan and, and, and to drive something because you've got to have some mechanism yeah. you've got to have some mechanism to to understand where you're at what to do next and 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 those well, types of things yeah. but 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 no i agree um a rigid plan certainly not well, um, a, plan, a plan doesn't measure where the business is does it so i think i think what simon's saying it, it kind of resonates with me so a plan, a plan is like you can plan certain elements of change i.e the deliverables of certain change activities i.e we need to do this comms and we need to do this training we need to do business readiness activities etc but the plan never tells you that uh, you know, stakeholder group A are really good. They're on board. We've got rapport. They're doing the things we're doing. You know, it doesn't. It doesn't really help you with that. No, it doesn't. And I, I say every probably probably every day, start change early, yeah. because it's always going to take longer than you've planned it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and, and, yeah. and and so <laughs> I know I'm using the word plan, but the. You, you kind of set a plan around those those hard dates that you know you can fix to, and then hope change works in between. And and Simon and I and I have had many an offline conversation about this um, because you see so many technology driven change transformation programs drive to dates, but they're so reliant on people change. But that that gets to a much harder level when you get closer to those dates and people still aren't ready if they're not ready. But you don't know how to judge that. It's difficult to play that. And so I, I guess that's kind of what I'm trying to say, and I don't think I have an answer for, for us, but but, um, but it seems like we're nowhere near in our change methods yet, yeah. if you know what I mean, to what we've just discussed of what would what really uh, what changes behavioral change does do you see what i'm do you see what yeah. i'm trying to say uh, we, we, we we're still quite immature in in what we're trying to do and how we measure things maybe maybe we're not maybe i'm being unfair on on us but yeah i, I think because we said at the top of the conversation you know the bit the, the, the for example the, the the stairway model of behavioral change it comes in processes and iterations and this conversation has evolved through iterations of yeah. different viewpoints listening giving and taking so you can't have a plan that is structured with the the number of times you're going to engage with stakeholder group A and then expect to have an outcome after that. You will have an outcome to the degree with which that was successful. Yeah. But like you were saying, Ian, start, start change earlier, which means engage with people, start getting them to understand about that change is happening. Doesn't nec- they don't necessarily need to know what the change is, but just loosen their position or listen. You've got a chance to listen to them, mm-hmm. gain the trust. Then when you've got some some value proposition to put in front of them, they're more likely to say, OK, this guy understands me. I want to listen to what he's saying. And maybe there's um, 
I, I think there's always a dichotomy, certainly in the types of projects that we get involved with, where, they, where you're implementing a system, that the system isn't ready to explain to people the deep change yeah. associated with it yeah. and, until probably we're, we're testing it, the business is testing it. So as change managers, we have a, a, a role to play almost in like account managers to these stakeholder groups where the example oh, that no. you, you gave Jonathan the example you gave where you've got a, a, a people feeling overwhelmed it's all coming yeah. at them but if you're the account manager there and you you set up a separate session where you just go I'll, I will translate this for you yeah. I'll calm you down I'll, I'll make it doable and, and seem doable and I'll help you and assist you along the way and I think that's a, a big role for change managers that account management piece yeah. um, which is difficult because you know it's almost like an additional bit of work what do they call it they, you know it's stakeholder management that they in all yeah money. <laughs> in old money it's stakeholder management but just as you were saying that there um you know i was trying to explain to to a prospect um this week why they need change management <laughs> right and 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 you and then defining different roles yeah. In that, in that, in a change management group, if you want, you want to call it that, um, and and you kind of end up getting into a conversation around roles and responsibilities. And I can't think, other than stakeholder management, I can't think of, and I don't think that explains what you just said. Yeah, um, I think it's part of it, but I don't think it's an element, like of, it. A, an element of it. But I, I like that. I like the whole account management piece. And again, that needs to get into that that role because it yeah. is you're right it's exactly what i'm thinking about you know i've worked with jonathan quite a lot so i know how he goes about things and it's exactly that you know people are almost waiting for the change manager to turn up and say don't worry this is what it all means yeah and have have those um empathetic conversations and and, and i've said to you many times Ian, is a sort of mantra I, I, I saw a chance out. Having the right answer isn't always the right answer. So technically you might be correct. The system will do X, Y, and Z for you, but people don't want to hear that. They want to hear you demonstrating an understanding of their world. And, and, Absolutely. And I, yeah. And I, and I read this quite recently that um, uh, change should happen in their world, not yours. It's not about you. It's about them. And as soon as project teams get that, you know, it, it, products and services. That's that's what this project team is offering. They're offering a product and and a sort of service, if you like. And if people ain't buying, you've got to have a look at what it is you're offering or how it is you're trying to sell it. Yeah. And temperature checks and all the rest of it. You can understand where stakeholder groups are to a degree, but it's only the person who's having the regular interaction with those people who really gets gets to understand because you go to the the sponsors and the senior people in in faceless steering committees and they'll say you know oh this is going on in this area i know because it's my people but like we said before <clears throat> earlier on culture is what happens when managers leave the room yeah so there's a there's an underlying level there that only people who are re in regular contact can either understand and influence because they've got the relationship. Thinking about the England football team and our culture, there's a, there's a key thing here with, with change, which is about fairness. And it's, it's in our culture. And I think it's in human nature as well, the way we've evolved. So if the process of change is fair, you're more likely to get people wanting to come to the table. You know, that, that's why we have the phrase, oh, fair enough. You know, uh, so in what you what you were saying, Jonathan, there, where you've got the, the stakeholder group that hold throwing their hands up, over overwhelmed. What they're feeling is this is unfair. Yeah, the why, balance why of the relationship is, yeah. isn't right. Yeah. yeah, this is unfair, and so fairness has to be a big thing in the in the process, as does autonomy. And those are big motivating factors in in the workplace. So that that kind of just that whole conversation just uh, is a good way, I think, of explaining why why you need to do that change piece I'm not saying i know you guys know that already right but 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 really? there's a lot of people who think <laughs> no there's a lot of people think you just i'll just throw it in know, and they'll, they'll they'll manage it and i've seen so many managers say look our, our team's pretty good right they can take on some pretty good challenges you, it, just just tell them what they got to do when and they'll they'll get through it do you see what i mean but what we've just said there is that's probably not true in many a case 
Yeah. Um, and it might be with some people, admittedly, but but you know, the wild card of all transformations is still people. So <laughs> whichever way you look at it, uh, mindsets change, all all that stuff. I, I, and I can't help but think modern methods and of delivery and and more and more is quicker, more out the box, more standard way is missing that piece. Mm. More and more, or it's shortening the cycle in which it can work. So, so maybe we have to get better at that, as as you you call it, negotiating change or whatever it is. The the you know the behavioural change. Maybe we've got to find a quicker, better way of doing it, where we still are fair, we still build that trust, mm. we still, you know, maybe those steps need to be yeah, an escalator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, I don't but, know, but, but can don't it you be? Find, but don't you find that it's it's in those conversations that are unplanned um, and not not formalised in, in, in the sense. So naturally, before COVID, you'd, you'd be wandering around the offices and you catch people in kitchens or you catch them in the corridor and go, oh, yeah, how's things going? And then you get snippets of, of info, yeah. listening, active listening, empathy. So all these kind of natural... Um, well, I say natural. If you're if you're that way inclined, <laughs> natural <laughs> behaviours um, kind of uh, kind of exhibit themselves. And and I think even in this kind of pandemic world, like I I regularly have um, you know quick catch up, even five minute chats with with people. And there can be not 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 a specific planned meeting to talk about agenda items A B C D and E, but just generally we haven't caught up for a few weeks. How's it going? <laughs> You know, because you just, I just find like, again, this is why it resonates so much with me. It just opens that door mm-hmm. and naturally people like to talk about themselves because yeah. <laughs> it's a natural thing. And and then generally you can kind of, yeah, understand what's going on in the world, their world. And this could be a senior stakeholder. It could be an important um, subject matter expert that, you, you, you know, you need to, to kind of lay with. It doesn't matter. Um it's people you that are influencers. Could, you could relate some of that to sales, right? Oh, you know, yeah, yeah. You called it account management earlier. You know, and 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 sales, sales have been building relationships for years. You know, salespeople, their relationships, and and we've digitalized more and more of that sales process. And some people prefer to go and look through some kind of digital way. Um, as, so as, as much- <laughs> Simon's holding a book up. <laughs> the sell is human. Yeah, 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 no, exactly. So maybe we need a a kind of a customer experience or CRM type thing for transformation. You know, that 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 that, that kind of. I don't know. I'm playing, but 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 it, it's building that. It's understanding the cus- the project, understanding the customer, mm-hmm. and helping the customer, yeah, change to what they actually want. Yeah, is beside themselves if you want. Yeah, do, do you see what I mean? Yeah, um, I, I I don't know. I'm just trying to think of the right kind of. I suppose I've got in my head that, that this, we've got a lot of work to do in this area and I want to try and find some answers, you yeah. know? I think what you're describing will be revealed at some point, no matter what the culture is in an organisation. At some point, people will vote with their feet what they want and you'll get it through through actions. Um, so we all know that thing in a meeting room or generally in life when people are nodding their head and you know that that's a false yes. You know, they're, they're mm. just saying yes to, to, to make you be quiet or move on yeah. or just get out. Get it. Yeah, it's a false. It's a false. Yes. And further down the line, you will get to know what the truth is. And it might have to be a lot of these kitchen chats to get there. But that's that's where they're so valuable. And then <clears throat> the account management piece and staying in touch with them. You can never undervalue the regular contact with people and then the ability to find out what they're feeling as well as as well as what they're thinking. Um, and then you build up credibility. If I do that for you, if I solve that problem for you, and then you might have to do a bit of legwork, and then you've got some some credibility in the bank, which means you usually get something back. I've seen that so many times. And then you start to crack that nut, and it softens, and the trust comes, and then people share more, and then you really get to understand what their state of mind is as a stakeholder. Yeah, it's that term, emotional bank account, isn't it? Yeah. So, you know, people make withdrawals out of the emotional bank account all the time. 
Yeah, but when, when, when is someone going to deposit something back in, you know? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, you, you get it. If you kind of think of it in that way, you you, you see it kind of happening. Like the cash register's opening and people just taking and taking and taking. <laughs> yes. You're like, no, no, there's no more left. That's it. Yeah. You, you're done. You're, you're out. <laughs> yeah, and that's what people people try and sell too early. They try and get to yes too early. Yeah, it, it, it's like they try and push what it is the project is trying to do. It's almost like the the, the recipients of it should be grateful. <laughs> yeah. You know, we we're coming here to turn your world upside down with this <laughs> brand new system and way of working. You should be really grateful. It's like, well, hang on a minute, you, you know nothing about my world. Yeah. You know, and I, 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 I run this part of the organisation in a way that you don't know about that really works through the informal networks and ways we get things done. You're going to come in here and tear it down. Well, yeah, 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 you are though, aren't you? I mean, yeah, you, uh, I, I mean, even from the vision statement, if you want, and and and, um, you know, you're trying to sell the yeah. vision. You're selling. Yeah. Yeah, day yeah, 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 yeah. Day from day one, even if I mean, many organisations don't even have vision. But anyway, uh, but, but 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 you know, even Hopefully from that, yeah, <laughs> from that point, you know, you're trying to. But it's almost like we should be going the other way. But somehow you've got to. You, you want people to change for a reason, right? And it might be value. It might be to survive. It might be lots of other different different reasons why but the mm. the reason you're doing that change project or that change program or that transformation program is for some what should be some valid reasons right so you sell a vision of why and and, and all of that kind of stuff yeah and, and, and the journey that you, you're kind of hoping that the organization will go on to but that's still selling that's not listening to see and I think that's quite interesting. And it, it, it comes back to something that, that I believe a lot in. And actually, Simon, this is how you and I met. I was talking about rich pictures. Mm. And it's talking about putting a picture out of what you're trying to achieve for a transformation, but not just putting it out, a poster. Mm. It's a talking point. Yeah. It's a discussion. It's a, well, how do you think we're going to get there? Yeah. It's, a, it's something that can be used as a tool. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, when, now. yeah, when I first came into Rich Pictures years and years and years ago now, it's probably nearly 20 years ago, um, it was used as a board game in that transformation I was working on. Mm-hmm. Play this kind of game of, of that drove you down why we need to change. Yeah. And really brought out the why. Yeah. Um, which is a sales thing, really, but it's also allowing those questions, those responses, and maybe building some of those steps. Very much. If if delivered in the right way, so again, another good reason why I still stand by them. But but um, no, I think I think um, it's finding more of those tools and techniques. I think as well, um, it is negotiating. It, I think it is. I think well, it's negotiating change. Yeah, it's sales. It's negotiation. I mean, they're, they're, they're hand in hand. Uh, it's, it's communication, engagement, all of those things. Um, and it's quite interesting nowadays because a lot of organisations are, are changing for for very strategic reasons. That you know their target operating model, because the environment they're operating in, their customers are receiving products and services different. So the the whole environment's changing, very disruptive, and. To then sell that to, to to Johnny, the production manager on the floor, who's knocking his widgets out with his team in a very good way, you know, that that's quite a sell for him to see the top level reason and why, and yet and yet out of work. There's so much disruption going that that, that that Johnny's surrounded by change and probably adopting it left, right and centre. Yeah. But in, in work, he's got to be shown the reasons and it, that has to be through a series of, of of interactions and processes for him, for you to display, yeah, I get it where you're coming from. Now, you do, do you get why that our direction of travel is there? So... Why, why do you think, yeah. Why do you think that's different than inside work and outside work? Then what's what's the kind of perspective? Uh, there? I think it's what's in it for me is different outside of work. So you give me a mobile phone and I will work out how to use it because I want to use it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's in, what's, what's, what's in it for me? You mm-hmm. give me an accounting 
programming work i might not want to use it <laughs> but but do, do you know what i mean it's it's kind of um I, I i think i maybe i'm being a bit wrong here but i think the reason we adopt things quicker or change outside of work is because they're the things we're okay with doing it, do you know what i mean we want to do them what's in there's something in it for me you know wh why why do we why why do we jump on to downloading movies so quickly against going to the cinema because what's in it for me, I can sit at home, I can do it, it's cheaper, what, all these different things, you know. And then as soon as you start to, you know, um, it, it, there's, there's so many, I think it's what's in it for me. And I think in business, it's difficult to, I, I always say this again, it comes back to my value stuff, but, but, but if you can find value for everybody, you've got a perfect transformation program mm -hmm. because you can then use that mechanism because people will want it. Because they yeah. can see the value of it. Mm. There's obviously, there's obviously other changes outside of work that you don't want, but you you do them because you know. Uh, but, then, but the urgency is there for you to do them because you see, you know, whether you see the value in it, but you have to do it. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, I mean, we could have this conversation that. about uh, you know yeah, um, cli climate climate change is a big one. Yeah. But until you start to see the problems, yeah, that's that's a good point. And by that time, it's too late, right? <laughs> Mm. And and this is one of the big challenges that we've got with that. And and the, 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 um, I've forgotten. Is it Greta? Um, Thunberg. Yeah. yeah, but that's what she was trying to say. Totally admire her for it. She was trying to say, if you leaders don't act this way, how are you expecting everybody else to do it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 You know, and that's the same thing, isn't it? It's the same. I mm. Yeah. But they've got to see it and believe it and see the value in it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then we will. Yeah, 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 yeah. And start to do something about it and de demonstrate seeing it. Yeah, and well, that's what's happening, isn't it? Which is a good thing, right? Um, and, and, and I hate to think people have to protest to get these things done, but at least then people start to see that people want this. Yeah. Do you yeah. see what I mean? They want to look after the environment and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I mean, it's probably a, a, a massive, complex topic, actually. But, <laughs> yeah, but, sure. but, 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 but do you know what I mean? It, 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 it's the same thing, isn't it? What's in it for me? It's tangibility. Yeah. Tangibility. So that, that, that whole example there with Trash Island, you know, yeah. which is the, the outcomes of, of certain behaviours for the past God knows how long. Um, if you see tangibility in, in terms of we do X and now we can see that being reduced, something that you can kind of not get your hands on, but something that you can kind of visualize or see and go, ah, I've done this and this behavior has now led to, to this. What's hard is that sometimes it's going to take a good few years mm. in that example before you probably even make a dent in, in some of that. Well, yeah, but if you paid to pick up my waste, pay me yeah. to pick up my waste and I'll go around and pick up everybody else's as well. Yes. Yeah. 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 I know it sounds silly and it's a bit silly economics, but do, do, do you know what I mean? It's what's in it for me. Yeah. Mm. I also think there's a different culture comes to bear when people go into the workplace. So they make free choices outside of the workplace with their changes they want to engage with and take on. They go into the workplace and there's cultural norms that they fit to, whether consciously or subconsciously, that influence their how they behave. You know, you see, I'm sure we all find ourselves responding to an email in a way that we wouldn't do normally, a text message <laughs> to, to somebody out, out of work, because we're sort of, um, yeah, we're, 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 we're towing a particular cultural line internally. And Well, that's the problem with social media, isn't it? You've hit the nail on the head there with why people can get a bit with social media. It, 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 it can be pretty wrong the way some people... And well, that's because that's what we expect in the workplace. Do you see what I mean? And and that kind of thing. Mm. You're right. Yeah, you're dead right. I think. I think. Um, okay. Well. Well, uh, that's quite a meaty discussion, really. <laughs> so, 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 it was always so, going to. It's always going to be. Yeah. So, what would be raising the bar in this particular context? Then, what would we? What? What? What out of what we've discussed is raising the bar. Raising the bar for me during this discussion would be the understanding of the techniques to engage with people you're inviting to change, the facilitation techniques that you've you've outlined and, and you and you use, and really trying to make a process out of all of the elements that we're talking about. 
to bring about more successful change, which was the question you posed halfway through the conversation. How do we gather this? And, uh, you know, I think organizations need to spend more time on this. And how, how do we gather this and make it happen? So, well, how can and, and can we speed it up? And I don't mean that in a I want it quicker or I want it faster because I then can. But I think I think it's better for people. Yeah. <laughs> if yeah. we can help people quicker. If yeah. that makes sense, and 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 you 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 said it there, and I don't think I hear it that often. How do we invite people to change? Yeah, and mm. it's inviting people to change rather than how do we make people change? Yeah, completely yeah. different vocabulary. Yeah. You know, in in what you're saying there, um, I totally agree with you. I think it's how can you learn more about those those ways of doing things? Yeah, and then how can we get better with those where that's really raising the bar? Yeah, l- language, approach, techniques, realization, giving it the, the full length of time, um, coaching the project team, yeah, coaching seniors so they understand what it is you're getting at, trying to demonstrate progress so they give you a bit of breathing space to do it, the account management bit, um, you yeah. know, do, doing all of these sorts of things um, will bring about a better outcome. But it's within the pressured environment of uh, traditional project delivery ruled by a plan where you've got to tick things off. That's yeah. being able to make that balance with limited resources, et cetera, all the things that come into play in the real world when not, not on a discussion, a podcast discussion. <laughs> but <laughs> that's, the, that's the real skill is being yeah. able to sort of recognise that and, and navigate and uh, negotiate within those parameters to still get a good change outcome. Yeah, that's so, the, yeah. the bit that kind of resonates there is that coaching, coaching yeah. other teams, especially, in, you know, in your programme or project team. Yeah. And so that they understand that you need to go through these these iterations with the business and and not only is like, oh, we don't have to worry about change because we've got the change manager in now. Oh, thank God for that. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's like, no, 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 no. We, we, you know, we're all here to do set uh, kind of activities, but we've all got to help each other at the same time. And, and, and again, that goes back to behaviors in, 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 in your colleagues and, and teams so that they help you and yeah. not hinder you. And uh, yeah, so, and that just calls back to my own experience mm. because it can be quite, I've, I've been in that program where it is lonely. <laughs> you're trying to fight the change. I say fight, but you know, you're trying to, um, you know, manage the change uh, challenge. And you do feel like you can be on your own when you program team working against you sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And you need that program team and you need that change network. We talked yeah. about that in the past. And, and if you have those things working and we bring in some of these techniques and things we've been talking about. Yeah, I can see that. that that's massive. Yeah, that adds a massive amount of value. Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. So a beer and butterfly um, book on the subject. <laughs> field yeah. manual. Oh, about field that. Man, we, yeah. we, we've got yeah, field man, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we've got a we've got a series of those coming up at some point, I'm sure. Yeah. Is there a book um, to be made here? Is that what we're trying? Uh, to absolutely, that's how Tim right. Ferriss does it, isn't it? You know, yeah. he, he he interviews <laughs> loads of people, then writes it all down and sells the book. Yeah. <laughs> along the way. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, no, thank you for that, Simon. That's uh, it's good to to kind of explore the the conversations of change there, and uh, and and like I say, very much unplanned, but it's quite good to just flow. And yeah. uh, I enjoyed that. Yeah, I did. I yeah, I got a lot out of it as well. Really yeah. good. <laughs> it's yeah. cool. So let's shall we wrap up this uh, episode then with the the pub quiz question? Yeah, so, go for it. it. Okay, so I've got this one again. So I think you owe me two back in. Just do I? Okay, yeah. no, that's good. no, I'm not, no, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I owe you now. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's recorded unless you yeah. edit it. Out. Um, but no, this this question is uh, a kind of a, a drink question because I thought, okay, oh, you know, well, might, might might be all right with this one. You might be okay. <laughs> you never know. How do you know your cocktails? Are you good on cocktails? Oh, I'm not too. Mm. Okay. Now you got me worried. <laughs> so this one is it can be what, about beer. <laughs> no, it's not beer. Uh, no. So what are the two main ingredients of a dark and stormy cocktail? Dark and stormy. Dark and stormy. Not one I know. It's so a dark. It's got to be something dark. <laughs> yeah, but stormy <laughs> is even harder to think about what that could. Uh, yeah. In dark, you could go for a, a rum or a. Mm. Or even a 
black current or something. Do you know what I mean? That kind of a thing. Or a Guinness. Dark. Getting back to beer. Now, um, uh, <laughs> there we go. I, I have no idea. Any ideas, Simon? Um, I, I think the rum theme sounds sounds about right. Stormy. Stormy rum, sailor. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, I like that. That makes sense. Yeah. So, dark, dark rum with Coke. Bubble storm. Coke. Don't know. Stuff, isn't it? Yeah. Stormy. But that's just a rum and coke. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe that's it. It's a rum and coke shaken up. Yeah. Shaken up frothy. <laughs> yeah. But no, like we'll we'll get to the answer on, on the next episode. But no, thank you. Thank that's you. The barman behind you. No, yeah, yeah he, he, he won't talk to us. We've been here too long. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't paid our tab yet, have we? <laughs> no. He only talks to us when we're leaving. Absolutely. <laughs> But no, thank you, Simon, for, for taking your time out and, and having a chat with us. It's been really, really fun. And uh, yeah, I've, I've enjoyed it a lot. So appreciate it. Cheers. Thanks yeah, for thank you. Yeah, you're Cheers. welcome. Thanks thank a lot, you. lads. Cheers. No problem. See you next time. Cheers. to that. Okay, so we're back. It's question time. Uh, so this is a good one, actually, because we've had a few questions uh related to our first episode um are all around procurement and the fact obviously sarah walters uh came on and did the episode with us as our very special guest and we've had uh, a question um basically come through so what we thought we'd do instead of answering a procurement type question for me and Ian, that's because we're not the experts here we'd ask sarah to actually answer um Perfect. The question. so we're off the hook this uh, this week mate <laughs> <laughs> Don't have to listen to so much of our dulcet tones. Absolutely. So we'll, we will uh, uh, basically let Sarah uh, handle the question. So over to you, Sarah. So we've had another question in from one of the listeners to the podcast. Um, and the question is, as an SME, what do I need to have in place to feel confident to approach corporate companies to bid for work? In other words, what do I need to do to stand a chance of getting onto their PSL or preferred supplier list. So I think this is actually a really great question, but I don't actually think it's it's a very easy one to answer because there are so many parameters at play when companies run tenders. There isn't really a this is what you need to do to get to get in the door. However, um, I do think there are some things that um, you can consider um, that most large organizations will be looking for when they're um, putting work out to tender. So I think the first thing I would advise you to do is get clear on your sweet spot. So what is it that you're offering, selling, you know, what's your USP basically? And make sure you can clearly articulate that. And then I would only respond to those opportunities that you feel are a great fit for you. So as a smaller organization, you will potentially be lower cost and more agile, maybe offer more flexibility than some of your larger peers. So I think if you make sure that you focus on those requirements that actually fit really well with you, then you've got more chance of of being considered and potentially even winning the business. I think the second thing I would say to consider is make sure that you've got processes and policies in place that large organizations will be looking for to show them that you are serious and professional. And also to make sure that you can actually get through that basic level of requirement. So they will have some due diligence boxes that they need ticking. Um, Some basics I can think of would be things like anti-bribery and corruption policies, information security, ethical trading. And they will ask for those to be demonstrated for every single tender that they go out for. Um, You should also be thinking about making sure you've got the right level of um, professional indemnity and public liability insurance. And you might need to be prepared to invest some money to increase the levels um, if the clients are asking for that. Um, it's, it's okay to ask them to justify the levels they're asking for, but, but I think, you know, if you, want to, um, if you want to be considered, then they would expect you just be able to tick those boxes. Um, another one in the same sort of vein is also be prepared to sign up to their terms and conditions. Uh, I don't mean you should do that without review. You should absolutely review what they send you as part of the tender. But I think the, the thing that you can do to be prepared is make sure you've got good legal support available 
available who will take a pragmatic and risk-based approach to reviewing the terms for you um, and you know, highlighting only key areas of risk. Um, I think saying yes to the customer terms is often a prerequisite for being considered um, and it makes you more easy to deal with than some of the other organisations who might be trying to push their terms. Um, It's okay to highlight risks and say you'd want to talk about certain points, but I think if you're generally okay to work on their terms, then that, that stands you in good stead. Um, And I think the other thing I would say is don't oversell. So I think your response would need to be comprehensive, but clear. Um, Sitting on the other side of the fence, advising clients when they're looking at at responses, there's nothing worse than trying to pick your way through a really over complicated response. So I would say make sure you answer all the questions. Ideally, follow the customer's structure or their numbering system with the questions they've asked you so that you can make sure it's really easy for them to see where you've answered their questions and then it will be easy for them to read. Um, You obviously need to demonstrate you can meet the requirements, but I think you need to also be honest about areas you can't fully support. It won't necessarily um, take you out of the process, um, but I think there's no point trying to cover up the fact if you can't actually meet meet all the needs. Um, And I think you can allude to other products and services that you could offer around the edges of the scope but I think it should be secondary in your response and sort of um, definitely segregated into a separate section so that they can either look at it or not look at it as they decide they want to. Um, And I think, you know, with a number of responses to review, there's often a tight timescale. Anything that you can do to help um, them get through your response quickly and efficiently will will be appreciated. So... Um, I hope that's helpful on that one. If you want to record a question for next time, just, you know, um, just record that question, send it to hosts at beerandbutterfly.co.uk because we love to to get people's voices on this podcast right in. Yeah, no, that's great. Sounds good. Great. All right, see you next time. It's last orders at the bar, so thank you for listening to the Beer and Butterfly. As always, we want to encourage participation. You can get more details of the episodes on our website which is www.beerandbutterfly.co.uk. That's www.beerandbutterfly.co.uk. You can get in touch with the show by emailing us on hosts at beerandbutterfly.co.uk. Send us your questions, written or recorded, or come and join us at the table as a guest. Also, check out our LinkedIn page, Beer and Butterfly Podcast, and on Twitter at butterfly underscore beer where you can engage with the show directly and get involved. Yeah, and we look forward to seeing you at the table next time. Bye.